Um, my name's Ben Goldacre, I'm a doctor and uh, I'm now an academic working in epidemiology and I also write about problems in science. So for a decade I've written a column called Bad Science in the Guardian newspaper in the UK. I wrote a book called Bad Science about problems in science more generally uh, and my current book is called Bad Pharma which is specifically about distortions in the evidence base for clinical medicine. Um, and I've been asked to talk generally to you about problems in transparency with clinical trials. As doctors, we need to have access to all of the information about whether a drug works or doesn't work, and also about how well it works, in order to make informed decisions about which treatment is best. And we make these decisions with our patients. But unfortunately, we can be misled. We can be misled in two different ways. Firstly, we can be misled if the results of whole clinical trials are withheld from us. And secondly, we can be misled if we are deprived of access to information about the specific way that the trials were designed. So there can be methodological tricks and quirks in a trial's design, which means that it is biased in favour or possibly against finding a beneficial effect from the drug. So because of this, we need to make sure that we have access to all of the trials that have been conducted, but we also need to make sure that we have access to a very large quantity of information about each individual trial. Unfortunately, we know that this is not the case. We know that overall, for example, half of all of the clinical trials that are conducted and completed are never published. Now, being published in an academic journal is not the be-all and end-all. It's not the only way that we can get access to information, but that's a very important metric. <coughs> One other way that we can try to get information about whether a clinical trial has been conducted at all, about whether its results were positive or negative, and also about whether its uh, methods were sound, is by trying to get access to information about it from, for example, a trials register, generally run by a regulator, and lastly, by getting hold of something called the Clinical Study Report, which is a very long-form document describing in enormous detail lots of information about the trial. And what I'd like to talk about is the, the, the things that have been attempted to fix this problem of trials going missing in action, and the extent to which they have failed. So the first thing which everybody, I think, has probably heard of is the concept of a trials register. Now, a trials register only tells us about the trials which have been conducted and completed. It doesn't tell us anything necessarily about the results of that trial. But it does give us some clues, because if we can see that trials have been conducted and completed, then we can then look to see if the results have been made available, and so we can try to spot the gaps. Unfortunately, the trials registers that exist have not been successful because they've not been adequately policed. So we've known about this problem of publication bias in medicine since the mid-1980s. The first proper clinical trials registers were set up in the late 1990s, and the first problem that happened was they weren't used properly. People didn't bother to register their trials. So then the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors came along and they said, well, we are going to insist that people publish their trial, uh, register their trials, and if they don't register their trials, we won't publish them. And after they made this commitment, everybody said, oh, well, the problem has been solved. We know now that all the trials must be registered because the ICMJE, the medical journal editors, have said we're not going to allow anyone to publish in our journals unless they've registered their study beforehand. But unfortunately, we discovered in 2009, so five years after the ICMJE made this promise, we discovered in a paper uh, by Doug Altman and colleagues, published in New England Journal, we discovered that Half of all of the trials published in these ICMJE member journals were not properly registered, and a quarter had not been registered at all. So we know that the journals broke the promise that they made through this informal system of making a promise to insist on all trials being registered. And that's perhaps not very surprising because, of course, journals have a strong incentive to publish glamorous and exciting um, trial results because they will get citations, perhaps they will also get reprint orders, and they will get uh, um, advertising. So they have a financial interest, but also a personal interest in eliciting citations to make their journal impact factor higher. So that intervention failed, and it relied on a voluntary system. The next thing that happened was the FDA Amendment Act. And the FDA Amendment Act 
2007, said that all trials must be competently registered, and it also made a second insistence. They said that all trials must post their results within one year of completion of that study. And unfortunately, there was no public audit. And public audit, public transparent audit, of whether or not laws have been adhered to, is every bit as important as having a law in the first place. So this commitment was made in 2007, and we didn't find out until January 2012, from a paper published in the British Medical Journal by Prail et al. We discovered that only one in five of the trials on clinicaltrials.gov had met this reporting requirement. So that is an extremely low compliance rate. And yet, no fine has ever been levied by the FDA against a company or a researcher, because of course, these problems are just as important when it is independently funded academic researchers. No fine has ever been levied, and if a fine had been levied, it's $10,000 a day, which sounds like a lot, but that's only three and a half million dollars a year, and that's really nothing more than a parking ticket for a company that has annual revenues of tens of billions and revenues from one drug of several billion. So we know that the laws of clinicaltrials.gov have failed because they have not been implemented and also because there was no public transparent audit to ensure that they were compliant, to ensure that companies and researchers were posting their results. But we also know that even if people had posted all of their results to these registers and even if they had posted everything that's required of them to the registers about how they were doing their trial, we know that that wouldn't be enough because we now know in some respects, thanks to the fantastic work that's been done by the Nordic Cochrane Collaboration, Peter Gotchi, but also the Cochrane Acute Infectious, Acute Respiratory Infections Group on, on Tamiflu, we now know that a, a, a magnitude of sins, a multitude of sins, can be hidden from view in the short report on a, on a trial's methods in a, a, a trial register entry, or even in an academic journal article. And that's why we now know that we need to have access to the full clinical study report. And this is a document of several thousand pages, which gives in enormous detail information about how the trial was conducted, what the analysis plan was, what the inclusion and exclusion criteria were, in much, much more detail than was ever given in any clinical trials register. We also know, unfortunately, that the European Medicines Agency has failed in its own commitments to be transparent. In 2004, they were required by law to make a transparent register of all the trials which were, um, uh, which were being done in the European Union. They made this register as something called UDRACT, but its contents were kept secret for many, many years, over half a decade. So this is a rather perverse phenomenon. This is a transparency tool, a clinical trials register, whose contents have been kept entirely in secret. When I tell the public about this, they laugh. I worry that maybe to you this sort of revelation is old hat. For the last couple of years, the European Medicines Agency have been stating that they will attempt to make the contents of UDRAX publicly available through the European Union Clinical Trials Register. But unfortunately, although many, many people incorrectly believe that this is a job that has already been done, as far as anybody can tell, it is incomplete. So as far as we can see from the data releases about UDRAT, there are approximately 35,000 trials that have been registered in the European Union Clinical Trials Register. And as far as we can tell from looking at the publicly available version of that, we can see less than 20,000. So we know that, that just under half of all of this information is still being withheld from doctors and patients. So that is still not a transparent register. And this is a very serious problem, especially because the European Medicines Agency has also made a promise that they will post the results of clinical trials in summary form, which is not satisfactory for us to understand the flaws in a, in a trial. They've made a commitment, nonetheless, that they will post results in summary form on this clinical trials register. And that is a very long way off, and all of the deadlines for managing to do this have been put back repeatedly. So we know that the current system doesn't work. We also know that self-regulation from industry and individual company initiatives also do not work. So I have personally been very heartened over the last three weeks to hear GSK standing alone and making a commitment, a promise, that they will share more individual patient data so that people can see 
um, this information and use it to conduct their own analyses. However, we must remember that so far this is only a promise, that no information has been handed over them, and it has to be seen in the context of an organisation which has a proven track record of making commitments about transparency and then failing to meet them. As far back as 1998, SmithKline Beecham set up what was, in many respects, the first properly functioning, publicly accessible trials register. They made a public commitment that they were going to post information about all of their trials in progress. And Ian Chalmers, the founder of Cochrane, stood on the same side as them and the ABPI to launch this at a press conference. Just a couple of years later, when SmithKline Beecham joined with Glaxo Welcome to form GSK, this trials register was summarily removed from the public domain. It was taken down from the internet, and that information is now inaccessible. So that was a commitment to transparency made voluntarily by an individual company that was then broken, but was met with enormous fanfare at the time. A couple of years later, I'm sure you'll remember the peroxetine scandal, where GSK were again caught out withholding vitally important information about an antidepressant and its use in children. And as part of their settlement with the United States government, particularly with the state of New York, they made a commitment to post extensive information about all of their clinical trials online, once again. And this came in 2004. I'm sure many of you will know that in um, July of this year, GSK was subject to a $3 billion fine by the FDA for repeated acts of criminal and civil fraud, <coughs> misleading doctors and patients about the benefits and uses of their medicines. And one of the key components of this was that they had withheld information about a diabetes drug, rosiglitazone, and that was as late as 2007. So that was many, many years after another commitment to transparency from GSK. So I think that shows that although we should be enthusiastic and always, of course, welcome individuals and organizations, and I have a great deal of, of respect for Andrew Whitty, I'm sure that he means well, although we should welcome these promises, they can only be judged by results, but also individual promises can be gone back on. They can be rescinded when there's a change of personnel and when there's a change of culture in a company, which is why these issues can only be addressed with substantive regulatory change. It's clear from clinicaltrials.gov being so widely ignored. It's clear from the fact that only one in five trials that were supposed to report results within one year uh, 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 only one in five have actually managed to do so. It's clear that, that our current regulations have very obviously failed. It's clear that voluntary disclosure is not enough. And so that's why I think we need to, to work very carefully on having some real fixes, fixes which cannot be worked around. Firstly, we need clear muscular legislation from the European Union's rulings on clinical trials. We need to say that data disclosure must be the rule, not the exception. We need to say that the results of all trials and all relevant information about those trials must be made available to doctors and patients at least within one year of completion of that study. We need transparent audit, so we need well-structured and openly accessible databases, because I should be able to download the whole of the European Medicines Agency's clinical trials database myself and look and see what the expected reporting date is for the trial results and what the actual date that those results have arrived on turned out to be, if it has come at all. And from that, I will be able to generate a very simple list of all of the trials which are overdue, all of the companies, I will be able to rank them by which companies and which researchers and which research centers and sponsors are the worst for withheld data, which drugs are the worst for withheld data, and we will be able to hold industry but also the European Medicines Agency to account when they fail, if they fail, to hold companies to this ruling to post results within one year.